podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Today is October the 16th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the Friday series of DDA updates. Our presenters for today include Bernie Simons, the Deputy Secretary for DDA, and we'll also be hearing from Drew Smith, consultant, Adrian Holloman, Director of Nursing, Chioma Ani, LTSS Program Manager, Valerie Roddy, Director of Fiscal and Operations. We also have Patricia Sestoki and Rhonda Workman uh, doing Q&A. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There is uh, three handouts for this webinar, and you can find them in the handout section. And we reloaded them uh, since the start of the webinar. Um, if you have trouble with that, they can also be emailed, and they are also on the DDA website. We will be recording the webinar and post it on the YouTube link on the DDA website. Questions can be typed in the question box in the webinar panel to your right, and we will get to those towards the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Simons. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay, Donna? Yes, you sound great. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So good afternoon to everybody who's on this webinar, and thank you again for your continued support in attending uh, these webcasts. Uh, I hope that they've been informative and uh, resourceful to our attendees, and even for the people who have, have not attended since we've uh, recorded this and put this on our website. Uh, today we're going to share some updates on uh, several important pieces of information about our participant and family survey on COVID. Uh, you may recall we did one on, on the providers and then we had worked on one for uh, participants and family. So uh, you'll get an update on that. I will do the update on uh, the regional numbers that I've been doing. And uh, we will also talk about COVID health and safety and what to consider and provide an update on the EVV implementation uh, based upon uh, the demand also that of the request. Uh, we will ha also have some discussion about uh, the retainer days and guidance. So again, thank you for uh, joining me today. Next slide. So uh, as you know, our highest priority is always health and safety and the well-being of uh, people that we provide supports to, their families, our staff, our providers, our case management. Um, and this is a critical time for all of us, especially as uh, we get into the fall and winter season and then start looking at uh, the possibility of where are our numbers. I mean, if you look at the news nationally, you'll see that uh, there's a creep factor in some states. Uh, I think we've been fortunate here to stay under uh, 4%. Um, and obviously we need to follow good health practices in everything we do. Um, and we also have the flu around the corner. And so, uh, you know, people hopefully are starting to get their flu shots and, and we start taking a look at uh, all of the resources that we have on our Department of Health website uh, for these um, um, guidance as well as the, the DDA uh, website. So this morning we received uh, an update from Dr. Fetter. Um, we had some questions uh, from uh, participants uh, in the webcast. And so uh, it's basically a checklist for recommendations for group home outbreaks, et cetera. That's on our website. And um, I believe it's also in one, one of the three handouts in the presentation today. So again, I appreciate your concern and your continued support and all of us uh, moving forward, um, hopefully at a very slow pace, um, you know, health and safety comes first. Um, we know we're still seeing uh, some people testing positive. We know some of the staff, and you'll see that in the numbers have been testing positive. And so um, we'll get to that a little bit in the uh, presentation. I've asked Drew Smith, who's a DDA consultant from uh, Alvarez and Marcel, who was the lead on the participant and family surveys on COVID with his team to uh, go over the results. So, Drew. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Simons, uh, for the opportunity to present today. 
Um, yeah, as Bernie mentioned, for those of you who were able to participate in the Dep Deputy Secretary's August presentations, you may recall that our team had partnered with UVA to conduct a COVID-19 provider impact survey, really measuring how the pandemic has impacted provider operations. Today, I want to share some key findings from a sister survey that we conducted in partnership with DDA, asking individuals receiving DDA-funded services and family members how they've been impacted with COVID-19. You know, in, in the data that we'll present today, we are showing really only a portion of our findings, some of the key data points. For, for those interested in learning more about this data, we are planning to conduct a more in-depth walkthrough during the November Families webinar. Um, and so, you know, let, let's get started. So, as stated, the intent of this survey was really to identify the impact on people receiving services and their family members. The, the goals here were really to understand what's happened since since March, since, since COVID has occurred, since programs have shut down, and what are the changes in how services have been delivered or utilized during this period. And really with the, the goal, you know, of how does this impact reopening or how does this impact service system development coming out of COVID? So with, with that, we can move to the next slide. So a little bit about the response rate. So as, as indicated in the slide, nearly 1,400 individuals and family members provided information about their experiences. You know, as shown, we received a majority of responses from individuals and family members receiving traditional services, as well as, as those receiving or participating in self-direction. I do want to note that we did receive responses from all of the regions. And so what we're working on now is, is how do we make sure that regional offices have access to their region specific data so that they can use this and they can react to it, um, at, you know, to, to really inform their plan. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So we'll, we'll start off on the data. And so, you know, again, as we look at the data today, we, we really want to focus in on some big impact areas to, to give a flavor of what we're seeing so far. And so what we'll be looking at today is really the impact of COVID on those accessing meaningful day services, given the significant impact on program closures immediately into the pandemic. And then really how have individuals and families interacted with supports being provided virtually? So on this slide, from really a, a high level view, what we see is that across the states, for those who responded, it is identified that over 50% of individuals receiving services did so virtually. So while there are regional differences within the rate in which virtual supports were, were used, this data does indicate that virtual supports have played a significant role in service delivery through the pandemic. Next slide, please. So focusing in a little bit on Meaningful Day and the role of technology, the data on this slide illustrates that overall 52% of individuals receiving services and 53% of family members would like to continue some form of virtual supports moving forward. You know, a special note, and part of this is we can never look at data just as one component because there are a lot of factors that interact within somebody's life that, that might drive responses. We, we looked at, um, in, in our survey, the age of the person being respond, who is responding or the family member of who they are responding about. And what we identified there is around 58% of, of respondents represented in the survey fall into the age group from 18 to 35. So as we look at this data, and really we, if we focus in on the component that says, you know, I want to use virtual or remote supports only and not go into some sort of physical day program, we thought, well, well what, who's in that group? Because I think that's really important data and that's higher than I personally thought that we would see this come back. And what we see there is roughly 50%, 57% of this group are age 18 to 35. And so I think what may be reflected here in this data is as younger uh, people are coming into the service system, as the service system has been different, their expectations of how services may be delivered moving forward are being reflected here, which I think is positive. That's what we wanted to, to be able to see. What we also see here is there are a proportion of people who said, you know what, I want to go back to the way that things were. I want to go back to my meaningful day services, to be in person, uh, and to have those interactions. And so I think as we think about this from a systems planning perspective, based off of the, the interactions that people have had so far, it's important to think about the context of both service delivery systems. Next slide, please. So, you know, as the pandemic required facility-based meaningful day programs to close, we were really interested in understanding how, you know, during this closure, individuals receiving services may react to returning 
facility-based services. And so as indicated in this slide, we see that nearly 41% of individuals who received meaningful day services pre-COVID do not want to return to back to facility-based services post-COVID. And you know, the, the reasons for this range from health concerns of being in areas with multiple people, which I think we're all still dealing with, uh, to you know, people have had different opportunities throughout this process to try different things or to think about what they may want to do coming out of COVID. And so you know, I think, again, contextually, this is important for us to just be aware of as reopening plans are being developed and stakeholder engagement is trying to say, what does the system look like coming out of COVID? Next slide, please. So, you know, anytime we talk about virtual supports, we also have to think about the access that people have to technology to support virtual supports. And so as we think about this interaction uh, that people have had during COVID with virtual supports, and we start to look at this data around people interested in maintaining it, we, we need to think about what is the capacity for people to access it. And so as indicated in this slide, we see that roughly 87% of respondents have identified that they do have access to some form of technology that would support virtual supports. Now, importantly, as we look at this, we see that there's a proportion of about 13% of people in this survey who have said that they do not have access to adequate technology. And you know, if we were to extrapolate this out, that number would likely go up, especially as we get into more rural communities. And so as we think about virtual supports versus in-person supports, we do need to be thinking about this access and thinking about how do we run a dual model so that people have choice, but people are not limited by barriers. Next slide, please. So then we dive a little bit deeper and we say, okay, so you've used technology. Um, what's that experience been like? Have, have you enjoyed it? Would you continue it? And I, I think what's interesting here is we do see that the vast majority of people who have used technology for virtual support, as well as family members, have said yes. Um, you know, with some supports or to some degree, I would like to continue using virtual supports, which again, you know, from a planning perspective, what, what we need to start thinking about is how do we build infrastructure to support that um, so that people do continue to have that option. Next slide, please. So lastly, a slide not about technology or a specific program, but one that I think is very important. <clears throat> so this slide indicates that there is a portion of individuals currently receiving DDA funded services who still struggle with implementing preventative measures to reduce the risk of exposure or spread of COVID. And so as we think about the data presented in this in the previous slide, yeah, we think about the words of the Deputy Secretary in his opening remarks and in, about ensuring health and safety and what services look like moving into the, you know, quote unquote, new, new world post COVID. It's important for us to really understand the importance of options in the service delivery system moving forward. So I'll, I'll end on this note. Um, you know, one of the questions that always comes up around data is what do we do with it? So as I stated, the, the goal is really to share this data with regional offices and aid in their work with stakeholders in identifying what reopening may look like when the time is right. We also hope to continue to understand the impact of COVID and the solutions used during the time to support those with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families and sharing that full finding and sharing the full findings of this survey. And with that, you know, I just take the opportunity again to thank DDA for the opportunity to partner on this survey and to share the results with you all today. That was good. Thank you, Drew. And I just want to thank all of the almost 1,400 participants and families who completed the survey. Um, we'll be taking this information into consideration on figuring what we're going to do uh, with that feedback to enhance our service delivery system. And so now um, I want to give uh, an update on uh, where we are with people who have tested positive, negative, and uh, unfortunately, the number of people who passed away. So as of yesterday, uh, the 15th uh, of October, the South region had 278 uh, confirmed positive cases, 88 negative, uh, nine pending uh, results, and 17 people have passed away. In the East region, we've done 47 confirmed, 195 negative, 10 pending, and no one has passed away in the East region. Central region has 289 positive, 621 negative, 18 pending, and 19 people who have uh, passed away. In the West region, we've got 46 uh, confirmed positive, 
245 uh, negative, one pending, and three people who have passed away. Um, now, I want to report out also, because we've been doing this also with the uh, staff uh, in the uh, agency. So in the South region, we've got 193 uh, staff who have tested positive and four staff who have passed away. 56 in the West region and one uh, staff who has passed away. Uh, in the East region, we've got 89 uh, positive staff and we've had no deaths uh, in the East region. And in uh, the Central region, we've had 296 uh, positive uh, COVID and uh, two uh, people who have passed away. Next slide, please. So um, again, this information is uh, just from this week ending on uh, 10 15. Um, and as you can see, the pie chart that we've been showing on all of these webcasts uh, is basically about 1,775 people, 96% of the the people uh, that we support and about 4% uh, have tested uh, positive. And then uh, the chart on the right basically is a breakdown by the uh, four regions. Next chart, uh, next slide, please. So this chart on the left obviously is from September uh, 17th uh, until, you know, as I said yesterday, October 15th. And we have had no the participants pass away of the 660 uh, people who have tested a positive for COVID. And the chart on the right shows that 39 people who have passed away are about 5% of the people who have tested positive. So as you heard me say at the beginning of this webcast, this is critical time for all of us as we move into the fall in the winter season uh, with the possibility of rising cases as we see nationally. I think the state has been uh, fortunate here. People have done a, a good job with uh, washing your hands, social distance, et cetera. And so we need to continue to follow good health practices since we're all in this together. And, you know, we've got our resources on our Department of Health as a reference, that, that website as well as DDA, and please take advantage of that. I'm going to ask uh, the Director of Nurses for DDA, Adrian Holloman, uh, to share some health and safety information for your consideration. Adrian. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as um, as, we, as, uh, doc, mm, as Deputy Secretary Simons mentioned, our number of positive cases have increased. This is not unique to DDA, but it's consistent with nationwide trends. To add insult to injury, we're now entering our flu season in the midst of this pandemic. And we do know that our population is at a greater risk for complications and hospitalizations related to the flu. Therefore, we wanna make sure that we're doing whatever we can to help minimize the risk and ensure their health and safety. We definitely wanna keep them out of the hospital, right? Because we know the complications are, are great when they enter that. And just from a personal note, I wanted to share um, our hospitals are, are um, my aunt went to the hospital the other day, and I'll move quickly, uh, and she needed an ICU bed, and it was difficult finding one in the state. They were talking about moving her to D.C. So, again, we want to keep our, our people out of the hospital. We want to keep them safe. So, therefore, we want to make sure that our uh, participants are receiving both the flu and the pneumococcal or the pneumovax vaccines. Um, we also want to encourage our staff to receive the flu vaccine. You noticed in um, Deputy Simon's uh, comments and remarks uh, where he talked about the flu vaccine or talked about the number of staff that were positive. So we want to keep both our staff and our participants safe. We want to, um, we can get there. You'll find that there are numerous flu vaccines, um, flu clinics going on all over the place. Um, you can go to the websites and find them. We have Walgreens, CVS, and some are even providing the drive-through clinics. Uh, you can also reach out to the primary care physician for both the flu and the pneumococcal vaccines. Again, encourage staff to get vaccinated. Uh, we, have, we have found that with the COVID-19 that some of our people were exposed by the staff, and the same would be true during the flu, vaccine, during the flu season. Continue to protect yourself. And, and the people that you're serving in the homes, utilizing the everyday, uh, um, the everyday preventive actions recommended by the CDC. 
such as your face masks, your hand sanitizers, when hand washing is not possible, and maintaining six feet apart from the people when they're out of the home. You may also visit the DBA website for COVID-19 information section for resources that will address the preventive measures for your specific agency or population. Next slide, please. So health and safety remains DDA's prior priority in relation to the service delivery uh, when, providers are when providers are considering reopening in-person uh, meaningful day services. The DDA encourages providers to reflect on how service delivery is changing and what innovations are needed, including exploring new ways to support people using technology, as well as the impact on the more traditional facility-based services and transportation. DDA's framework for reopening provides a few examples of how providers are utilizing virtual communication options to provide those supports and services to the individuals in creative and innovative ways um, while maintaining the health and safety of the individuals and their staff. So the CDC has stated that small gatherings are a growing source of the spread of COVID-19. And we wanna make sure that we're, we're keeping our folks safe. So if we're trying planning to host or attend a gathering, these are a few things that you wanna think about. You wanna think about the location of the gathering. CDC has said that outside is always the better choice, but we know now since we're in Maryland, we're gonna get some cold weather, so outside may not be an option. Um, you can, however, make sure the area is well ventilated or opening a window or door if possible. Maintain six feet away from the people that are not from your household. So if you're having a gathering of 10 people and there are two homes, then the folks from one home can be together and then the other group need to be six feet away in their group so that you're keeping the, the families together. Um, you also want to make sure the size. Again, we're avoiding large groups. CDC says we need to limit the number of people in our groups to smaller groups. You also need to think about the location from where the people are traveling. So if someone's coming from a hot spot or areas where you know that the people are positive or they've known positives or exposures, then you want to not invite them or you want to minimize that contact. Um, also for behaviors while people are there. If the people are not maintaining safe behaviors or safe activities that are going to be safe, then you have to be very mindful of that. So if they're unable to be safe or they're choosing not to be safe, then this may be an opportunity that you either leave the, leave the gathering or isolate yourself wherever possible. Um, also, <clears throat> for our meeting for day, oh, no, no. also reflect on how our service, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the last one, I'm sorry. So as we approach, as we approach the holiday season, it's important to be diligent. Um, for our meaningful day, if did I miss the meaningful day, we just also, again, want to make sure that um, you're revisiting the, okay. So we're gonna reflect on how service delivery is changing, I'm sorry, and what innovations are needed. Um, we wanna make sure that we're exploring the new ways that we're using technology, as well as the impact on transportation. Again, we're looking at the framework for reopening. Um, that's going to provide you some examples of how to support our individuals. Remember, the goal is to provide the needed supports and services while maintaining the safety and health of the others. You can always reach out to your regional office for support and guidance as needed. Next slide. Self-care. So we want to make sure that we understand that there appears to be no end to this pandemic and that the stress of the pandemic is becoming our norm. The problem is prolonged stress of any kind is not good for our physical, emotional, or mental health. The level of stress is heightened when, you're, when you are the responsible person or caregiver. Caregivers experience higher levels of depression, frustration, 
and anxiety. And when we as caregivers receive that level of uh, frustration, we want to make sure that we're not taking it out on the people that we're serving. So it's important that we're maintaining our levels of stress. It's been said that you cannot pour from an empty cup. So if we're running on E, we have little to give. So if the airline says, I want to encourage you to put your oxygen mask on first so that you are able to help those who are dependent on you. So there are a lot of things that we can do for re relieving stress. Um, if you Google stress relief, you'll come up with oogobs of, of things. So we just wanted to... Um, concentrate on just a couple of things. And we want to remind you that taking care of yourself is not selfish, but it is selfless, meaning you care enough about the people you love and or are responsible for that you understand the importance of taking care of you. So one of the things that we talk about are deep breathing exercises. These exercises are great because they send a message to your brain telling it to relax, to chill out, calm down. And it can be simple as using the four by four by eight method, which is taking four breaths in through your nose, holding it to the count of four, and then releasing it to the count of eight. And you can do that through your mouth or through your nose. And the, the thing is, when you're doing that, it's just a reset. It can be that simple, or you can add imagery to it, or you can add affirmations. It can become a part of your lifestyle. Um, so that you're using it to maintain your balance and you're maintaining center. Movement is also um, a wonderful stress reliever, whether you're exercising, jogging, walking, or swimming. The movement releases endorphins or feel-good hormones that lifts you and improves your mood. Yoga is another form of movement that combines the breathing with the movement, so you're getting the double benefit of breathing and movement to stimulate those feel-good hormones and to cause relaxation and calmness in your body. Um, music and dancing. Um, I like to kind of I like to combine the two because they work well independently, or they go together, and you get the enhanced boost when you're doing it together. The tempo of music can calm or soothe when needed, or it can lift and invigorate or rejuvenate. Um, it just depends on the type of mu music you're listening to. So for example, if you're getting ready to go jogging, you're not going to put on your simple love song, but you're gonna put on some Black Eyed Peas, I Got a Feeling, or some Eye of the Tiger, Rocky, so that you get moving. And so that's the impact that moving has on you. And then when you combine it with dancing, you're getting the benefits of movement, and you're also, um, getting those feel-good hormones. Studies on dancing reported that dancing has a positive uh, effect on the prevention and treatment of anxiety and depression. So when you're feeling a little low, start to put some music on and move with your music and move your body and dance and feel it and see if it doesn't change. There are some videos on YouTube of older folks dancing and it just shows the impact of how that music will move them. All right, laughter is another thing that is a stress reliever. It says laughter strengthens your immune system, it boosts your mood, it diminishes pain, and it protects you from the damaging effects of stress. Nothing works harder or, fast or faster than a good laugh. It, for a fun fact, one study found that laughing for 10 to 15 minutes a day can burn approximately 40 calories which could be enough to lose three or four pounds over the course of a year. So I guess I'm overweight because I just don't laugh enough. And our final slide are resources for you. If you're feeling overwhelmed by stress, and you can always ask from a health or a health professional, get immediate help in a crisis, and it just provides some resources for you. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over now to Chioma, our um, LTSS manager. Thank you, Adrian. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. So I'm just going to provide some information about our EVV Go Live um, that started on 10-1, just to share some of how it's going and some lessons learned that we've gathered in the last couple of weeks. So Eastern Shore and Western Maryland providers um, went live on 10-1. So, so far as of 10-15 yesterday, 
we had uh, almost 300 participants who have had at least one successful clock in and clock out pair over the last two weeks. And we have 21 provider agencies across those two regions who have at least one staff that is correctly using the clock in clock out system, which is our ISAS system. The first set of payments have been issued for the week of 10-1 through 10-7. Um, so that processed earlier this week. And payments were distributed to all uh, providers via EFT and or mail checks. So for providers who may not have been signed up for EFT or direct deposit for their payments, the instructions and information is found on the website as is linked here at the bottom of the slide. And we highly recommend and encourage that you complete that process. Next slide, please. So some lessons learned uh, based on the information that our ISAS team has gathered or MDH's ISAS team has gathered over the last couple of weeks. It's highly recommended that direct support professionals or DSPs practice with the practice line to get used to the call prompts. Some of the issues experienced um, so far or DSPs not being familiar with what to expect, um, and so maybe pushing the wrong button at the wrong time. Uh, what the practice line allows you to go through that in, in practice where it doesn't uh, make a difference and be able to get used to hearing the call prompts that are introduced in the system. Uh, it's also highly recommended that DSPs keep the provider MA number handy when clocking in or out so that you can quickly enter that at the point where it's needed. For provider agency admin or leadership staff, it's really important that you ensure that all your DSPs have a staff provider profile in LTSS Maryland that is complete. Uh, so it should have all the information filled out for that DSP, regardless of how often they serve someone who is receiving services from your agency. So that way, when they do clock in, the system is able to recognize them as your agency staff. So the resources for the items that I've just mentioned are listed on uh, the bottom half of this slide, but they are also on the web, on the DDA webpage, the EVV specific webpage. There is the details around the practice line and the instructions for how to go through that. And then there are some audio samples of the IVR process with or without an OTP token, uh, which allows provider agencies to be able to use that to help train your DSPs and help acclimate them to what they should expect. Next slide, please. Additional lessons learned as provider agency billing staff has started to review their billing information in LTSS. It's important that you do that on a regular basis. Um, as you come across various items or issues or something that you need additional help understanding, please reach out to MDH's ISAS team so they can coordinate um, and respond to you as needed. The email is listed here, mdh.isashelp at maryland.gov. Um, so overall, I just like to say that DDA understands across the board that this is a learning effort um, for everyone, both for providers and CCSs um, and on, on DDA's end as well. So we want to ensure that everyone has the appropriate support. We are continuing to work with our MDH uh, ISAS team uh, so that we can reach out to providers to share information and answer questions as they come up. Um, and I will hand it over to Valerie Roddy, Director of Fiscal and Operations. Thanks, Chairman. Good afternoon. So I want to talk about Retainer Day's guidance. Uh, next slide. Um, yesterday, DDA sent out guidance on retainer days through constant contact and also posted it on our website. Um, if you go in and click on the COVID-19 button, it takes you to a page where we have our various resources. And this is included under the heading of memos and guidance and directives. Um, the focus of the guidance is on the additional days that CMS has approved, specifically the 18 to 30 days and the requirement under Appendix K that the days be consecutive. Donna, do you want to pull up the document, the actual guidance? Please? Yeah, give me a second. Certainly. Can you see it? Yes, we might need to make it a little bit bigger, but that's okay. okay. I'm going to walk through it and stuff. So 
on the first page is an overview with basic information like the purpose of the guidance, the target audience, and, and which services are the subject of the guidance. Next page. Great. So page two includes the guide includes that the guidance is applicable to DDA providers of residential, meaningful day, and personal support providers. It also defines key terms. Some of the information includes that retainer days are now what we used to call absence or B days in residential services um, under Appendix K. So the terminology has changed. As mentioned previously, the definitions clarify the consecutive nature of the retainer days uh, for each service. Uh, next slide. Okay. So on page three um, begins the service specific guidance beginning with residential services. Key points here include that a provider could have provided 30 residential absence or B days between July the 1st and December 31st, 2020. Given the clarification from CMS, the clock started again on January the 1st, 2020, because retainer days are based on a calendar year. Retainer days must be consecutive and the important point here is that it refers to consecutive billing days. In the case of residential services, we know this to be a service that's provided 24-7, 365 days a year. So it really translate into consecutive calendar days, but it really does. But the overall concept of retainer days is that it consists of consecutive billable days. So if a provider billed for 18 consecutive days, but the person who the provider supports actually used more than those initial 18 days, the provider can submit an error update to capture those additional days up to a total of 30. Again, they need to be consecutive. Recognizing that providers submitted error updates to correct the attendance calendar because they billed more than the 18 days, DDA reversed the error updates. I urge providers, however, to check PCIS2 to ensure that the attendance days are now correct. If they are not, an error update will need to be submitted to correct the attendance calendar. Uh, next page. Oh, no, I, I told you to st stay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I jumped ahead too soon. Um, if a provider billed for non-consecutive retainer days, then an error update will be needed to correct this. We have received some questions about what happens after Appendix K expires. Based on what we know today, and I want to emphasize that, that based on what we know today, retainer dates in the future will not be required to be consecutive, that they will function more like the absence or vacation days that were allowed under the waiver for residential services. Okay, great. So at the bottom of page three and going on to the next page um, begins the guidance for meaningful day services. This is a reminder that these services normally do not have retainer days, but retainer days are allowed under the authority for Appendix K. When Appendix K expires, these retainer days will go away. I want to point out some key information about the consecutive nature of these days where meaningful day services are involved. Consecutive days means consecutive billable days. So if a service that's normally provided on Monday through Friday, then the next consecutive billable day would be the following Monday. If services are provided on Tuesday and Thursday, then day one would be Tuesday, day two would be Thursday, and day three would be the following Tuesday. 
We also know that meaningful day services may be provided by different providers. Therefore, multiple providers may bill for retainer days for one person. Like residential services, any attendance corrections will need to be handled using, using an, up, an error update form. This includes adjusting for the additional retainer days up to the total of 30, and also correcting non-consecutive retainer days. Donna, if you could just scroll up a little bit, thank you. The bottom half of page four addresses retainer days or retainer hours for personal support services. Given the increase of retainer days from 18 to 30 in total, there's a corresponding increase in the number of retainer hours from 72 to 120 for a calendar year. Here again, the retainer hours are only available through the authority in Appendix K. When Appendix K expires, the retainer hours will no longer be available. PCIS2 can accommodate both regular units and retainer units on the same day. Retainer hours in personal support services function a little differently, but they still need to be consecutive billable hours. For example, a person receives four hours a day on Monday, Wednesday, and, and Friday. That's their norm, normal service week. In week one, a provider can provide two hours of service and use two hours of retainer hours on Monday. They can do the same thing on Wednesday and Friday of that week. However, the following Monday, the provider provides the usual four hours of service, the regular schedule. That ends the first episode or the only episode of cons consecutive retainer hours. So the provider would only be able to bill for those retainer hours that were logged during that week one. Error updates will need to be submitted to correct any non-consecutive retainer hours. And providers can also use error updates to add retainer hours where cases exist where you were not able to bill for those additional hours because at that time we did not have approval for the additional hours that we now have. Since we know that EVV has went live for some providers on October the 1st for personal support services and that other personal support providers will be going live on November the 1st and December the 1st, I want to mention that LTSS Maryland does not currently have functionality to process retainer days or retainer hours. The DDA has been working with Medicaid and with our software vendor to see how we can handle this. Um, up until this point with the pilot group, you know, it was a small group, so we have been handling it outside the LTSS system but recognizing that we will be moving over 4,000 people into uh, using the EVV system and that we have 149 providers that will be using this system, we certainly do not want providers to have to do this manually. So we are looking to see how we can accommodate this. So additional guidance will be forthcoming from DDA once a solution has been identified. With that, Donna, I think we can go back to the slides, and I think we are now ready for questions. Okay, great. Um, so let's start with the questions. Um, and I have uh, the first question um, is for Adrian. Um, how long are the... Um, pneumonia shots good for? Um, we have some individuals that had them almost 20 years ago. Um, I would check with your provider. I, I'm sure it's no more than five. It's probably closer to between two and five. But check with the primary care provider to ensure if they're due. Okay. 
Um, and this is uh, Chioma for you, um, for EVV. Um, how do we know if we already have a, um, a uh, EVV set up or EFT set up, sorry? So for providers who are registering their new MA numbers via EPREP um, that completed that process in the last you know, eight months or so, um, it's unlikely that you do. Uh, so I would follow up with the controller's office to confirm um, and the instructions and contact information can be found via the link that was provided. Thank you. Um, and there's another one uh, for you, Chioma, is um, if a provider is using a staffing agency to fill gaps in schedules, how will the services be recorded to LTSS? The staff is not a direct employee and would not have been set up in LTSS. Sure. So for staff who are temporarily uh, working with your agency or are being filled in from a staffing agency, do need to be entered in the system if they are going to be able to clock in or out. Um, so they do need to be uh, recorded into LTSS Maryland. If it was a last minute um, fill in uh, that happened maybe just before the service was supposed to begin, uh, then you would be able to follow up within the system and have your billing staff enter that as a missed entry to record the clock in and clock out time for that individual. Thank you, Chioma. Um, Valerie, um, the, there's a book of questions for you. So I'll start with you here. Um, the, um, the retainer days, um, for residential V days, um, are there a limit to 18 and do they also need to be consecutive? So absent days or V days um, that are available in residential services, um, as I mentioned, they can be used from July through December. Now that we are using Appendix K during this time frame to provide us with some additional flexibilities, we are now looking at retainer days. So you can so what's only available now are retainer days. Vacation B days or absence days are not available at this time. So you are limited to retainer days, and yes, retainer days are consecutive. Uh, for um, can uh, can they bill across months? Oh yes. Yeah. So for example, if you started using your retainer days the last five days of the month of May, and it goes in the person you know, is still out of service through to the first week of June, absolutely. It, it's again, that consecutive time frame. So it doesn't matter if it cross, crosses months. So for retainer days, do we need to go back to last physical to do error report for these days? Well, I'm not sure which days, as I noted in the discussion and we have noted in the guidance absence days or vacation days that were used between July the 1st and December 31st are okay. So the use of vacation, you know, V days or absence days during that time period, that's fine because that's what was the um, in place that was covered in the, in the waiver. However, um, moving forward, we are now limited to the 18 days. And at this time, um, so long as those days didn't change or didn't use it, you just limited yourself to retainer days, you shouldn't have to do any error updates. If you're not sure, we will, you know, certainly reach out to us and let us know and we will work through that with you. Um, appendix, Valerie, this is for you too. Appendix K is set, up, um, is set up currently to expire in March. If pandemic continues, having substantially changed after the turn of calendar 2021, does DDA plan to apply um, to update or extend Appendix K beyond March? So right now, I think some of this is actually up to the federal government, and that is whether or not they extend the authority um, under Appendix K. Certainly, I think we will be very interested to see what happens. The public health emergency is still in place, and um, Right now, we don't have a crystal ball, but we are monitoring this very closely. Um, thank you. Uh, here's another one. Um, 
Has the DDA consider a more streamlined approach to reporting FY20 ret retainer days other than error report format? Concerned with the amount of work for region as well as providers and with so much focus needed to be on the successful implementation of EVV. So I do understand this. And actually we did. It took us a while longer to put the retainer day guidance together because we really were exploring ways other than an error update to correct these. But the conclusion was after our research and, and much discussion internally was that the only way to correct this uh, or make these changes accurately was through the use of error updates. We do recognize that this is a lot of work for providers and be honest, it's a lot of work for our regional offices and for DDA headquarters uh, because it's, we all know this to be manual. Uh, so it does uh, present a challenge for us. Um, that is one of the reasons why we did, I did not mention this in the presentation, but in the guidance, it does note that we are requesting that these error updates, because they really are affecting uh, what's happened in the past, particularly within fiscal year 20, to submit the error updates by the end of this calendar year. We want to have enough time for our regional staff and for our headquarters staff to process these so that the payments or the adjustments can be made during the fourth quarter payment of this fiscal year. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I have a um, question for uh, Chioma. How many missed entries are we allowed for EVB? So the current guidance, um, as is listed on the website and the information that has been shared, is that the missed entries are um, that are counted as a point are up to six per DSP per month. Um, but as was also shared and, and has been stated multiple times, DDA understands that this transition period um, is just that, a transition period. And as providers get up to speed, uh, MDH is working to give some allowance um, with that application of that time. Thank you, Chioma. Uh, Valerie, um, if residential days don't need to be consecutive after March 13, 20, then why do they have to be for January 1st to March 12th? So this is an issue. This is um, an issue that DDA has been looking at. Um, part of the challenge is that retainer days are based on a calendar year. So um, based on CMS guidance, that means that the clock started January the 1st. However, we know that this does not align with what was allowed previously under our waiver, given that we based the previous B days or absence days on a fiscal year. And this is an area that we are revisiting um, and we'll be providing probably further clarification. Thank you, Valerie. There was one here for um, a clarification. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to respond. But if um, Adrian, you want to add anything to it, that'd be great. Um, if DDA is suggesting that we require the individuals reserve to receive the flu and um, you know, cockle vaccine to receive services, we have gotten questions from parents and caregivers asking if this will be a requirement of day services, both in, in our building and in the community. So that is not a requirement that DDA is saying, what we're just giving information of suggested recommendations for you to consider. Um, I don't know, Adrian, if you wanted to add anything to that. Right, it's not a required, but it's one of the things that are recommended for um, Standard, it's kind of standard of practice for those who are with chronic illnesses or over 65. It's one of the things that are highly recommended from the providers and all the medical agencies for keeping folks safe. Thank you, Adrian. Valerie, back to you. Uh, is there a deadline to submit error reports for FY20 retainer days? Yes, there is a deadline. I just mentioned it. Um, actually, we're looking for all of them relative to retainer days. 
uh, to be submitted by December 31st so that it will enable both our regional office and our headquarters staff to get them processed so payment can be included in the fourth quarter. Otherwise, payment will be delayed to the first quarter of fiscal year 2022. Thank you. Um, and this is um, an EVV question. Uh, and this is uh, Southern Region starts EVV in two weeks. When will those in self-direction get OTP? And how many participants' phones can be listed um, and used, for example, home parents um, and cell phones? So if, Chioma, you can answer the EVV question and um, Valerie, the um, the self-direction piece. Um, so the question around tokens, um, for individuals, individuals who are going live or participants who are going live on 11.1 for Southern Region um, should be getting tokens if they haven't already uh, pretty soon. So we recommend uh, CCS agencies distribute those to the individual um, within the next couple of weeks that they have it before the go live on 11.1. But that does not apply uh, to individuals who are in self-direction. Valerie, if you want to add anything to that. Yes, and what I'll tag team on is, is that DDA is still looking at EVV solutions for self-direction. Uh, we know the clock is ticking, um, and so we hope to be, be able to provide some guidance soon. Thank you. Um, in this one, um, it's, it says, um, the guidance we just received in the last week or two stated that we only have four exceptions in EVV, and now we're being told six again. This has a major potential financial implications. So please, can you figure out the final answer so agencies can write policies around this? Chioma? So the the confusion or what may be um, coming off is, is confusing to provider agencies is that Medicaid's current policy is four. Um, and that is a policy that is applied across all of uh, the other uh, waivers that are non-DDA. Um, in DDA's implementation of ISAS, uh, we asked for a little room, a little extra room for our providers, and it was granted up to six. So that is where we are right now with the current policy that applies to DDA providers. However, even further from that, um, during this, this transition timeline, as I mentioned, MDH is being uh, very loose with that and not holding providers to that six until we are able to get all agencies in the system and it can issue the official guidance that says when it really starts to count. Um, so I hope that provides some clarity for you. We would recommend if you're live right now, if you go live on 11.1, that you start to track those points processes so you can uh, properly train or retrain DSPs and make sure they are adhering. Uh, but as of right now, Medicaid will not be um, penalizing or, or holding providers to that point until everyone is in the system. Thank you, Chioma, for that clarification. That's very good. Um, Drew. Um, there are some several questions about the survey and that the, some folks feel they didn't go out to people in self-direction. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the survey was um, communicated to our families and participants? Yeah, it's a really good question. And one of the biggest challenges anytime you do a survey is making sure that you can get it to as many people as possible. Um, you know, our, our goal in working in partnership with DDA and with provider agencies and with advocacy organizations was to try to get this survey out as widely as we can. Part of the challenge may have been that the survey was a web-based survey, and so it's reliant on making sure we have email addresses for everybody through those different branches of communication, um, or, or people are looking into the DDA uh, materials to, to be able to find that link. And so our goal, you know, as COVID continues is how can we continue to collect information? Um, and so that's part of the conversation we're having is how do we get more responses as we move forward? So here are the comments, you know, our, our goal was to reach as many people as we can and we, we got a strong sample, but definitely always looking to, to add more to it. Thank you. In addition to that, we did share with the DD Council in the ARC Maryland who shared it with their constituencies as well and posted it on our Facebook with different links um, for the past two months. 
Okay. Um, this one is uh, for Chioma. What were the total number of successful clock in versus the total number of clock ins? Um, if, if your question is referring to what was the error rate, uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, but it, it was as we tracked those errors or ice testing tracked those errors, they were reaching out to the appropriate providers. So some of the details where we shared um, around the lessons learned were based on the kind of errors where we were seeing. Uh, they were typically tied to either DSP information missing the system or uh, specific buttons being pushed incorrectly or at the wrong time. Thank you. Uh, Valerie, uh, will appendix care retainer days apply to supported living? Yes. Okay, Chioma, uh, will providers be able to get a practice EVV device for training? If you're referring to an OTP, no, you, you would not have an OTP for training if you are not going live yet. But if that if you are live or that person's OTP has already been distributed, you may use that um, for training as well. The instructions for the training provide an alternative number for the OTP that you can enter when prompted. Thank you, Chioma. This brings us to two o'clock and want to thank you all for your participation and your questions. And we will look at what's in our chat box. And if we need to provide additional guidance or add to our frequently asked questions on our website, we will do so. Have a blessed week. Thank you.